Hello and welcome. Um, we have with us uh, uh, Professor Leo Panich. He is a professor of political economy at uh, York University uh, in Toronto. Uh, he is an eminent Marxist who has been writing a great deal on the empire, uh, the role of the American state in the in the uh, global capitalist system, and particularly the role of the American financial institutions in upholding the basic structures of globalization. Leo, uh, <clears throat> thank, thanks for joining us today. It's great to be here on your home turf, Ajaz. <laughs> Wait, it's very good to have you here. Now, th there has been a crisis going on uh, that uh, the latest one that uh, <clears throat> broke out sometime between 2007 and 2008. Uh, primarily in the United States, from where it has sort of traveled beyond. Uh, <clears throat> by 2010 or so, uh, they were beginning to say that uh, the worst is over in the United States. Uh, now there's going to be, uh, the, the recovery has started and so on. Uh, but by the time this sort of situation developed in the United States, the crisis had deepened in, uh, in Europe. As of now, most of the major emerging countries, uh, let's say the BRIC countries, uh, uh, China, India, Brazil, uh, Russia, have not seen that kind of crisis, but there seem to be some indication that these economies are also now slowing down. How do you see the current situation now? Well, I, I think that uh, we're in the throes of a long uh, capitalist crisis uh, that is likely to last the better part of a decade. And of course, as with all such crises, this is really the fourth great one in capitalism's history, but if we go back to the Great Depression, for instance, things look like you're coming out of it in 1931, and then by 32, 33, things get even worse, and this leads countries to go off the gold standard, et cetera. So uh, uh, they take time. The one in the 1870s lasted until, people say, the mid of the 1890s. Right. Uh, so I think that's how we need to look at this. And there's no doubt that uh, the crisis spread, including to the great countries of the global capitalist South, remarkably quickly. Uh, and the lowest levels of trade uh, were being recorded by 2009 uh, for many decades. And, and there was a problem actually in raising funding uh, for international trade. And that really scared uh, the powers that be. The stimulus that occurred, uh, a coordinated stimulus amongst the G20 countries, but the largest stimulus in American history, outside of wartime. And a huge wartime. stimulus in China. And, and China's huge stimulus uh, did have an effect, there's no doubt, not in solving the central problem, uh, but in putting a floor beneath the fall. Moreover, the way in which the banks were bailed out, uh, especially by the American Federal Reserve and Treasury, bailing out even European banks and so on, uh, did save the capitalist banking system. At the same time, and part of the reason the crisis is now deepening, uh, the effect of the crisis was to undermine the tax base of states around the world. And insofar as states bailed out their banks, they often took on an additional fiscal burden. And uh, the, all of the capital that was flowing to allow in Europe, the peripheral states of Europe, to buy all these German exports. Mm -hmm. That was prim primarily being financed by private finance, yeah. in lending to private banks. Yeah. Well, once those private banks were in trouble, the public sector had to pick up the financing of whatever imports they were doing from Germany, or and slow down, essentially. So that shifted from having been a, pri a pri private sector deficit in, in, to a public sector deficit. And inevitably, the bondholders of the world who don't lend money because uh, they uh, want to support states out of the goodness of their heart, they lend the money. And this is true of insurance companies and union pension funds. They lend the money because they get a higher rate of return than they would get by putting it under the bed or putting it in American treasury bills. And they get frightened that those governments won't be able to pay them back. 
uh, and you know this money needs to be, these bonds need to be rolled over every few months or years, etc. So it's become very difficult for certain countries in Europe to be able to float bonds. Yeah. And that's how the crisis has now unraveled. And it becomes all the worse insofar as the recipe for this, demanded by the bondholders, and I think we need to realize this isn't only the banks that are demanding it and the hedge funds, it's also the union pension funds and insurance companies, etc. Yeah who are demanding that the first priority of public uh, finance be that they pay off the bondholders. Mm -hmm. The last priority should be social expenditure. Right. It's a class struggle. Yeah, yeah. It's a class struggle at that level. Right. Yeah. And in, in, in Europe, certainly, it appears to, to be the most severe attack on the European working class in some 60, 70 years. And it's been under severe attack for 20, 30 That's years right. anyway. That's right. That's and right. now it's it's on top of that. those who expect it... <clears throat> And, you know, there was reason had we had the political forces to do something about it. There was reason, heaven knows there was reason enough to do it, because I think capitalism did get delegitimated ideologically in this crisis. Uh, there was reason to hope that neoliberalism would, you know, see the end of its tether. On the contrary, what this crisis has amounted to is the deepening of neoliberalism. The seeing through of the structural reforms for flexibilization of labor markets, for the reorganization of, of the state, uh, to allow above all for flexibility. Uh, this has provided now an opportunity to get things through that they were never quite able to get through before. Sure. That's been on the agenda, that has been happening gradually. But, but now, now dramatic, it's really now being dramatic. pushed through. Tell me something. I, I've always wondered <clears throat> that Germany, which is the most prosperous country and has been sort of at the center of this economic boom in Europe and so on, um, has built its pros prosperity over the last 20 years or so partly by depress depressing the wages uh, relative to productivity gains and so on. How, why does the German working class take it? Well, as, as uh, Wolfgang Streeck, who is a Weberian political sociologist in Germany, who's now head of one of the largest research institutes there, uh, said to me once, this is a very rich country, he said to me in, 19, in 2001. We can withstand a period of stagnation for a decade without it being felt very much. And I think it is the case that uh, the German working class, especially at the level of the powerful shop stewards on the mm -hmm. shop floor, mm -hmm. did agree through the 1990s and into the 2000s that they would restrain wages in order to sustain German exports. Right. Right. Uh, and in that sense, it's the old corporatist type of labor capital strategy that has so marked German politics. And they cooperated with this. It wasn't so much an imposed raise restraints that it was worked out with these powerful shop stewards at that level, with the DGB. And they're prepared to do it because they believe that the way forward is to grow the pie in capitalist terms. Yeah. Uh, now, the effect of this in the rest of Europe is the Germans are exporting. But the notion that everybody can become an exporter like that, yeah. who, who will import? So the whole of this success has been based on selling to Spain or yeah, what have yeah, you, the and then generation. providing them with the funds in order to buy this stuff, sure, sure, right? Sure, sure. So the crisis is produced by this enormous imbalance inside Europe, yeah, right, right. which was never resolved. And it, but it's an imbalance that occurs at the whole level of globalization. The whole world is told that they can all become nicks. They can all become successful exporters. Sure, sure, well, who, yeah. Yeah, yeah. The, the, the irrationality of this in terms of who's right. going to be the importer of this yeah. Yeah. Is, is, is now what's being faced. Yeah. You know, the American state the American and the American working class still consumes a ridiculous amount, we of must course, say. Of course, of course. But the credit yeah. isn't as available, right. given so the restraint of their wages to do so. There. So the big question is, where is this global demand going to come from? This isn't the classical Marxist explanation of underconsumption, but it is the real question. Where is all this global demand going to come from? And when people say it's going to come from India and China, they forget that India and China's 
proportion of global consumption is still only one fifth of that Amer of the American. India and China together. Right. It's still only one fifth of that of the American. It's not going to compensate. Yeah for a decline in American consumption. Yeah. Uh, the other thing I wanted to ask you is, um, you know, in France, in Spain, even to a certain degree in Italy and sporadically in other countries, there have been a waves of strikes throughout the past decades. Certainly among the public sector workers, but also in other parts of the proletariat and students and, you know, generally uh, in the population in general, some of them massive and some of them highly impressive. How, how, what do you think, uh, have they gained anything out of these strikes? Where do they stand in relation this to is, unions, I think this political is, parties? This is the crucial question. Uh, not so much in Germany, but, but certainly in France since 1995. Right. There have been reactions to the neoliberal policies. The railway workers in France in 1995, the enormous... Uh, struggles by the marginalized youth in the outskirts of Paris, in the Ben Luz of Paris. You remember the student sure, struggles, sure, etc. And and more than that, you know, one can't say well, insofar as it's just one protest after another, there's a protest, as will occur here in Italy, in in India at the end of this month. You are going to have another trade union general strike in which all the unions will engage in, and it is important in its own way, but it's a one-day event, and it goes away. So many of these protests are of that nature. They're big, they sometimes they're covered by the media, sometimes they're not. They give people a sense of solidarity and struggle, but they don't institutionalize in a form that they build on one another. Yeah. And it's one protest after another. This has also been going on with the anti-globalization movement, of course, one protest after another. It's always there, but it doesn't amount to a means of changing the world. So one might have hoped that with the formation of an anti-capitalist party in France, which a lot of people were looking to, uh, which brought together some of the Trotskyists with some of the independent groups, uh, and the Trotskyists have always been a force that gets two, three, four, five percent of the vote, depending on the election, uh, that this was going to be a new type of political formation. The Greeks and the Portuguese have quite remarkable independent new left parties. You know, some of them breakaways from the old communist party, some of them new developments, etc. And the remarkable thing about is that all of that is that they haven't gained electorally in this crisis. Mm -hmm. There have been loads of protests in the streets, but that, that hasn't flowed at all towards the kinds of political organizations that could alter the pattern of state power. It's most remarkable in Greece, where uh, uh, Syriza, the independent left party, stood at 15% of the vote at the time that the great student revolt happened in Greece a couple of years ago, right? You know, they are now down around 5 6%. The communists are doing somewhat better. Uh, but still, you know, for all of these occupations and protests, etc., most people still say they would either vote for New Democracy or PASOK, the conservative, the, the center right or the center left. Mm -hmm. And this, for us on the left, is a tremendous you know, puzzle, yeah. uh, an impasse. And somehow we've got to figure a way. Yes, you know, that particularly uh, strikes one because, you see, one sees a contrast that in Europe, there have been the indignados and so on, there, there have been movements of that kind also. But the main thrust has been the working class or the more familiar kind of student protests, familiar from decades, you know, that, that sort of thing. On the other hand, in the Arab world, Tunisia and Egypt in particular, trade unions play a certain role, the working class plays a certain role, whereas the bulk of the protest comes from the youth and from other sections of society. In, in, in Tunisia, actually, it is said that about 85% of the population uh, participated in all that. And yet, the net result in both cases is you don't see the emergence of any significant political formation that can challenge the status quo. So what this tells us, I think, tragically, is that the defeats and 
the mistakes that the working class political organizations, the communist parties uh, of the Middle East and of Europe, suffered uh, in by the 60s, 70s, etc. Uh, it's left a vacuum that for the moment is unfillable. In the case of the Middle East, you know, it's very exciting. There is a certain pan-Arabism going on here just in the streets as they pick up from one another, beginning with Tunisia, et cetera, et cetera. And it's not, it wasn't particularly led by... But by walk in is, the Islamicists. Exactly. Because there's that vacuum politically. Right. And it's a bit like Eastern Europe, mm -hmm. where once the communist authority collapsed, take something like it's, Poland, it's, 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 there was the church. Off, yeah, it was often the far right. That it was the benefited. church, it was, exactly. Now, in the United States, where there hasn't been a organized working class socialist or communist politics, right? what we see replicated is the politics of social movements. Yeah. And, and, you know, some of it takes exciting new forms like the Occupy, but even then they hearken back, they look back to the civil rights struggle. Uh, as exemplifying the greatest successes of what they do. And the big question needs to be, where can this lead politically? I saw an interview uh, at the Oakland occupation of Michael Moore, the great documentary mm -hmm. filmmaker. And it was done by CNN. This wasn't some marginal channel. And he's standing there surrounded by black militants in Occupy. They'd been kicked out of Occupy Oakland already. One man was killed. Right. Then they reoccupied it. Right. Uh -huh. Okay. And uh, this guy from CNN, their leading interviewer, uh, says to him, look, the Tea Party, you know, tells people that there's somebody they can vote for. Who are you telling people to vote for? You say you're the 99%, who should they vote for? And he says, no, I don't think it's about that anymore. Uh, there, that, those days where we went to vote for an Obama or some other candidate, a Jerry Brown who promised change, and stuff, those days are over. We want a different system. Maybe capitalism once worked in the United States, but it doesn't work anymore. I'm not sure what that different system is. We want a different system. Well, the difference, I think, between the current Occupy moment, which is important, and the previous constant protest that goes on between elections in the United States is that discourse hasn't been heard all that often. It was much more particularist. It was much more about getting women rights. Uh, it was about getting poor people rights, getting black rights. But to speak of getting a different system, even if some of the leaders were inspired by socialist or radical ideas, you didn't hear that all that often. You've heard it more here. The big question will be, how out of the kind of horizontalist, uh, determinately non-leadership and anti-party position that most of the informal leaders have, how can that coalesce into something that will be an institutional alternative in the right, system? Right. And it's the old American question.